Welcome to the University of California San Francisco Sports Medicine Podcast featuring Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne discussing hot topics in sports medicine and society. All right. All right, I'll get started. All right, welcome everyone to our UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, six to eight weeks with myself, Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne. Today we have the honor of having Dr. Jennifer Beck, um, one of my pediatric sports medicine colleagues down in LA at Children, uh, UCLA and um, I always forget that hospitals down in LA. What's the official children's hospital name, Jen, down there? Orthopedic Institute for Children. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so once again, thanks for joining us. Um, maybe just to start out for our audience, just tell us a little bit about your background and um, how you came to orthopedic surgery before we jump into our, our, our questions. Yeah, I started out as kind of a two sport athlete with gymnastics and soccer growing up and then gymnastics is what kind of took over my world when I was in kind of middle school years and um, for me getting uh, introduced to orthopedic surgery because I was that cliche athlete that had some injuries had some time off, you know, some foot fractures, a couple different times and so got introduced just you know from personal experience and then realized I liked the idea of sports medicine and working with a team and, and having, you know, athletes to work with getting them back after, you know, time times and injuries similar to you know physicians had with me as well and and uh, spent all of my college and medical school years trying to convince myself to do anything else and realized this was the only place I'd rather be great um, yes, oh go ahead Brian yeah go ahead Brian um so orthopedic surgery obviously you're the minority so being a woman in orthopedic surgery you represent less than five to ten percent of faculty what was it like when you were particularly a resident and deciding to do ortho was it did that make the decision harder what sort of things factored into your decision because you were going to be a minority in this group yeah you know not only am i kind of a minority being female but i'm the first physician in my family so my family kind of growing up was very supportive and encouraging but just had all of the cliche stereotypes of too many hours not enough work-life balance and i think even getting through medical school um, as a female and really anyone who's underrepresented in any field uh, i think overcoming the stereotypes is the hardest and, and biggest challenge that you have i think we've done a good job within orthopedic surgery starting to really kind of waken up that we need to have diversity but it's talking to the radiologists and the internal medicine doctors and the ob guys some people who really have these stereotypes stereotypes and preconceived notions um, who would be, you know, very discouraging of things. Um, and I found very supportive mentors that were orthopedic surgeons. So a lot of times it was just talking to the naysayers outside orthopedic surgery and saying, you know, things are changing and things can be better. Um, and that I think was the biggest challenge that I had to overcome. You talked a lot about uh, your mentorship right now. What, what kind of things have you done or been able to do with some of the younger generation to kind of you know, incorporate them into potentially going into orthopedic surgery? Yeah, we know early exposure is the most important thing. So something that I've been the females is trying to get them involved in all of the STEM, math, sciences. We get them, you know, exposed to females who are in this field. We get them some saws and get hands on. We get some pig's feet and get them sewing, you know, which are practicing sutures. And so um, that early exposure, I think, has really been a great thing. And we do that a couple times a year. And just it's amazing to see all of these young females starting out the day very shy and timid. And then by the end of the day, they're so excited and so enthusiastic. Um, and that just takes a few hours and a little bit of exposure. And I think that's really been a big change for a lot of people. Okay, so I've got a true or false question. True or false, men are better than women at using power tools in orthopedic surgery. Definitely false. <laughs> <laughs> As, as many as many people who come to me and say, you know, with the stereotype that you have to be some big brawny football lineman to, to do, use all these things and do orthopedic surgeries is, you know, you should be working smarter, not harder is really nothing in surgery is that difficult physically. And if you're working that hard, you probably should change your approach a little bit. Yeah, so you've definitely seen Mirav. He is not exactly <laughs> a bastion of um, athletic strength. He was very fast but I think he weighs in 50 pounds lighter than everybody else on the service. So I think, you know, you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that I remember when I was a resident in the 2000s was you had to be these big, strong football players. And the reality was even in my class at UCLA, we had not an athlete, tennis player, swimmer, not an athlete, rugby player, but for club, and we're not sure how good he actually was and piano player and, and violinist. So it isn't a test of strength for the most part. Absolutely. We, we actually had a classical piano major in one of the residency classes a couple years below us, and he went on to be an amazing hand surgeon. So 
Um, I think it takes all different types of people and that's the most important thing. Yeah, the one thing that kills me when we get the applications is the ones that say like, I grew up wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon because I like cutting things in the in the in cabinets or I'm a woodworker. I'm like, really? I want you in the library. We can teach you how to use a drill because we're just drilling in and out. It's not that complex. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's the, the clinic that's the hard part and making those surgical decisions, who and when and why. Um, the rest of it is very teachable, agree. And Jen, one thing you mentioned earlier was um, you're like in middle school, really focusing on gymnastics. Um, and I think that like early sports specialization is certainly something that we all deal with. Um, and uh, what do you feel we should do as clinicians to impact that trend? And uh, do you feel like it's a good one, a bad one, or um, how do you come down on that? Yeah, gymnastics is one of those unique ones that, you know, the longevity of a gymnast is very short, that there's very few adult gymnasts. And so it's a little bit different uh, sport, you know, these artistic sports than than soccer and basketball and tennis that people can be playing throughout their lifetime. So the conversation, I think, is a little different based on what sport they're involved in. Uh, I think for me, you know, the hard thing is really making sure the family understands that this is a lifetime of activity that we're, is our goal, is we want healthy whatever level it may be competitive or recreational activity so that we reap all the benefits the cardiovascular benefits from long-term health and i think sometimes we get so narrowed down and focus on the couple critical years of junior and senior year in high school and how that's going to affect their long-term health and really if they get burnt out and you know have a multi-leg knee injury and then all of a sudden can't work out for the next 60 70 years of their life i think that's a bigger detriment than not getting that college scholarship now, you mentioned uh, gymnastics, Jen. Uh, you know, I think that's kind of a unique population. I mean, we all know the hours of how many hours you're supposed to be you know, doing per week. But I find that gymnasts are sometimes the hardest group to counsel, particularly since I think there is, and you can probably speak more to this, the uh, you know, kind of correlation with more hours you do it, the better you get, particularly in that sport. How, how do you deal with gymnasts who come into your, your, your kind of clinic and from your own personal experience about trying to have them limit their hours? Yeah, absolutely. I remember growing up, it was, you know, you had to try 10,000 handstands before you're going to get the one perfect handstand. And that was kind of a motto and mantra in our gym is you just repetition, you keep trying and trying until you finally get it. And, you know, I was a full time um, student, so I didn't ever come out and just train. And so I was going to full time school plus about 20 hours a week of gymnastics on top of that through, you know, many of my scholastic years. And I think the, the nice thing about gymnastics that people I think sometimes forget about is there's so many different aspects to gymnastics. And so if you have someone who has gymnast wrist, they can be working on different skills, all of their leaps, their turns. And, you know, I'll never forget, I had a, a gymnast who had a, you know, distal radius fracture who was so excited when, you know, she came to clinic to get her cast off because she had perfected her standing back top happen that they you know have other different other you know sides that they can be working on the balance beam um you know whatever it may be bars so that they have a lower extremity injury um and and really focus on, on that as well so i think you know i think this stuff is really interesting especially for gymnastics um you know there are other sports some people or some of the data suggests that swimmers have to specialize a little bit earlier um, certainly figure skating when the event horizon is really when you're 15, 16, not 21, 22, 23. How do you counsel parents for our more quote unquote traditional sports like baseball, volleyball, basketball, when they want to specialize when the kids are in single digits, essentially seven, eight, nine, maybe even 10 or 11? Yeah, I think the nice thing is, is uh, thankfully some of the collegiate athletes and the pro athletes are finally coming out and saying, hey, when we were young, we played multiple sports. And I think that's really a big push that these athletes need to see and these parents need to see is that you can be successful if, if that is their goal is being in the Olympics, being, you know, a collegiate athlete, um, that these athletes who are there now, you know, 15 years ago were multi-sport athletes. And I think they really need to be advocates as well. You know, we're, it's a little hard for us in medicine. We, you know, used to be this one of just telling kids they can't do things and you know we're the we're the no sayers and pulling them out and it's it's really that educated conversation and you know i try and focus on okay what's the short-term goals and what's the long-term goals and we really need to focus on both of those because i want you playing baseball you know with your kids and your grandkids and not you know so hated and burnt out of the sport that you can't do that and so i really focus on kind of both of those so that you can take the patient perspective of that travel team whatever that next season is but also the big picture as well and, and I think that's a lot of times where you can get the parents help is, is seeing, you know, we want your child being a healthy athlete uh, as an adult as well. 
Um, and then another topic kind of changing gears a little bit is um, the attention um, facing like female athletes, uh, especially their medical care. And it seems like historically, we probably haven't paid enough attention to like the specific um, issues in uh, female athletes. And what are some of the areas that you encounter unique to that um, group of athletes? And, um, you know, things like the female athlete triad are just, you know, kind of fill in our listeners on what we need to keep in mind there. I think one of the biggest things that we're working on in orthopedic surgery and in medicine in general is understanding our patient populations is that as you know, all of us who do academic research, we want to get this great power, we want to have this huge sample size and that means often we're clumping all these people together who are probably very different, you know, a seven year old female and a 15 year old female very different athletes than, you know, even a 15 year old male and a 20 year old male. And so I think that that one of the things that we on the medical side and the research side need to do better is is really isolating these populations and really determining what these differences are. We know different, you know, genders perceive pain differently. They they rehab differently. They have injury rates that are different, different mechanisms for them. So we need to do a little bit better a job of understanding that. You know, that being said, research is coming out that there are a lot of differences in, in many of those things is why the injuries happen in the first place, what we can do to help improve their surgical outcomes and complications. And I think acknowledging that there is a difference is one of the first steps, and then we can improve some of the research on it. You know, some of the things, you know, we think about is this female athlete triad that, you know, for many years um, really was focused, obviously, on the female athlete. They got stress fractures. They had, you know, eating disorders. They lost their periods. And I think for orthopedic surgeons, that's sometimes a tough thing to talk about and even approach. Um, I think in pediatrics, we're a little bit better about it because we're used to talking about, you know, skeletal maturation. But um, I think that's sometimes a difficult conversation to approach with some of these athletes. And so just being open minded to that. But I think also realizing it's not just a female issue that this, you know, is a whole condition that can happen with males as well. Um, they just have some potentially different presenting symptoms. Uh, when you have the female patients come into your clinic, uh, particularly who may be kind of, you know, having some of these issues, do you have a standardized way to kind of series of questions or people that come in to kind of counsel them is there you know how are you incorporating this into your practice more so than you know in more of a structured way as opposed to like in, on an individual basis so we actually have it as part of our intake forms and i think sometimes having that conversation verbally is very difficult um and that's something that uh, we actually include questions about you know delayed menarche or reg irregular menses um you know are there any other psychological concerns that the parents have and the, and the child have so that's actually part of just our standard intake that all of our patients get because you know i realize that we we only have so much time in clinic and sometimes those topics are just you know difficult for us to even approach depending on what that condition is they're coming in for their ac tear and you've got a surgical conversation to have. And so just having those little highlights on an intake form, just to remind you to kind of cue you in can be very helpful in that conversation or maybe as part of your post-op uh, conversation to have. Have you seen since the pandemic happened or is happening or will never end, um, have you seen more uh, females with a female athlete triad? So I think admittedly, I have a little bit of a skewed practice because I think I get more of the, the zebras than the standard um, kind of presentation. And so in my personal practice, I actually see a lot more males that come in with stress fractures, especially as it's been cross country season, because I think they come in with, you know, pain and symptoms that people just don't even think of stress fractures in them. And we have some excellent um, uh, non-operative sports medicine colleagues who I think do a, a, an amazing job at highlighting the female athletes. And I think our funnel here at UCLA is really good for getting them to the right place. And so my practice is a little bit skewed um, towards, you know, 14 year old males with thigh pain who people say, oh, it's just a quad strain. You're a runner, no big deal. And then you get an x-ray and MRI and they've got a stress fracture of their distal femur metaphysis. So, um, you know, I definitely see that skewed population, but I, we have seen a lot more of it from a bone health standpoint. People were just running too much during the pandemic or they weren't standing up at all. And, you know, as I've kind of coined, you know, this COVID jellyfish of people who just sat on their beds playing Fortnite, whatever video game may be, and then they go and try to join the cross country team. I think that uh, didn't turn out well for a fair amount of people um, for those, both of those reasons, both overuse and underuse. Um, and, you know, that kind of transitions into a good point, but um, are there specific changes that um, you would recommend to um, young female athletes and even all athletes, especially like with this you know, interesting return to activity challenge that we've been facing, but anything that we should have people incorporate? 
Yeah, I think it's a, an interesting topic is is strength training and weight training is that I think uh, inherently everybody thinks men are supposed to be big, bulky, they have to have all these muscles. So men need to spend all this time in the gym, they need to be lifting weights. But when you think of female athletes, people don't think about that. And I think that was actually really highlighted in last year's, you know, women's NCAA basketball tournament when they showed what the men's weight room looked like versus the women's weight room. Right. And just the amount of uh, um, equipment they had, the amount of staff that they had, the access to it. And so I think a really big thing that we think of with females uh, that we don't, you know, that the males it's taken for granted is what is their strength training? What is their conditioning? Are they just going out and playing soccer because they just want to? go have fun, but what are we actually doing to develop these athletes? And we really need to pay attention to those weight room strength and conditioning coaches and give equal access to both of our populations. Cause I do think that would be a great help for these female athletes in preventing injuries. And Jen, kind of switching a little bit of gear here are kind of our last question as we wrap up. Um, and this is a loaded question, obviously. So you get your 16 year old um, kind of collision athlete in the clinic, uh, male or female, what's your go-to ACL graft choice? So I've definitely switched over to being a, a quad tendon person over the last probably five years. Um, you know, fully admittedly, I'm only seven years in practice, so I'm on the younger side of things and have, have been, you know, seeing this trend going. Um, but the good news is, is we're, we're hopefully going to be having some research out, you know, comparing all the different graft types on the return to sports and actual testing um, and comparing them. But the graft has been, you know, a big, large graft. My patients, you know, have anecdotally been doing very well, obviously, you know, single surgeon experience. They do, aren't having the knee pain that the BTB grafts do. It seems like they recover very quickly to the to the point that I'm really trying to rein them back in, even at the six and, and eight month mark. Um, so I've been really happy with it. But again, I got to take a look at what the research is. And I think we really need more on that because lots of people are doing it and hopefully it's the right answer. Great. And how about uh, extra articular tenodesis? Are you doing that at all in the primary setting for kind of hyperlax females at all? Or what are your indications for that? Yeah, I definitely have. So revisions, I think for me, it's a no brainer. All of my revisions are pretty much getting it. Um, and then those, you know, if they've got 10 degrees of hyperextension, those ones that just really have those three B gross Lockman's pivot shifts, really obvious. Um, I have been adding that. And I know there's some concerns about some stiffness and slower range of motion that have happened. Um, and I think that those complications will be interesting to see how they bore out in the literature. But uh, I think it's it's a simple procedure to add. And it, right now we don't see a huge downside. Um, hopefully it's stays that way as we get more literature, but um, I've definitely been increasing my utilization of that in my practice. Great. Well, we could, we could talk about ACL graft choices for hours, but uh, we'll, we all, we're all heading off to the operating room or clinic. So once again, Jen, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it and uh, hope to have you on again. Got a lot to talk awesome. about. Awesome. Thank you everyone for having me. Happy to be on anytime. <laughs> thanks.